Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants in the United Kingdom and today we're going to be discussing case number six from our Facebook page. So our case today is a 30 year old lady presented to ED with palpitations following taking a tricyclic antidepressant overdose. So all her vital signs were okay, were with a normal on arrival, except her heart rate that was 173 beats per minute. So she's had a 12 lead ECG, and this was her ECG. So what I want you to do now is I want you to pause this video, have a proper look at this ECG, see what you think, have a diagnosis and a management plan on your head, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, welcome back. I hope you've done as we agreed. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at this ECG and see what we can come up out of it. Um, basically, the most important thing that I want to discuss today is uh, to have an approach when analyzing any ECG. So this is a good chance to cover some basic stuff about ECG interpretation. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about a suggested approach for ECG interpretation. There are so many different approaches that you can use and everyone has got his own way of um, analyzing ECGs. It, it's all about just covering everything in a way that you like, as long as you're not gonna miss anything important. So the approach that I would suggest today is the approach that I use, and I think it's a really useful one. So feel free to use it if you like it. Obviously, the first thing that you need to do is to make sure that the ECG paper is uh, the right one for the right patient and you make sure that the calibration is correct and the leads are in the right place, then you start analyzing the ECG. First question should be, how is the QRS complex? Four questions about the complex. Rate, rhythm, width, and axis. Next, you check the P waves and its relation to the QRS complex. Then you check the intervals, and the two important intervals that I'm interested in are the PR interval and the QT interval. Next, you check for chamber enlargement that include atrial enlargement and ventricular enlargement. And then you check for ischemia, looking at the ST segment, T waves and Q waves. And following this, anything else, so a J wave or whatever. So any other findings comes under others. So this is my suggested approach uh, that I would strongly recommend for any beginner with ECG interpretation to use it and to get uh, trained on it. So let's analyze our ECG following our approach. This is our ECG. So let's check the first three questions about the complex. Let's check the rate, the rhythm and the width of the complex. If we apply this, we will notice that the rate is clearly fast. It's about 170, so we are on the tachy side. We've got tachycardia here. The rhythm from the regularity point of view looks very regular. So this is a regular rhythm. And the width, whether it's a narrow or broad, this is a narrow complex. So if we uh, talk about this answering these three questions, We've got here a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia. So let's talk about this and let's cover the differential diagnosis of um, this condition. So when it comes to a narrow, complex tachycardia in general, we split them into regular and irregular. The irregular ones are three main ones. You've got AF. You've got atrial clutter with variable conduction, and you've got multifocal atrial tachycardia, MAT. The regular ones are also three. You've got the sinus tachy, you've got the SVT, and you've got the atrial flutter with a fixed conduction. And considering that our patient has had a regular rhythm, then this is the differential that we're interested in. It's either sinus tachy or SVT or atrial flutter with a fixed conduction. Good, let's move on. So to differentiate the three conditions, it's all about the P waves. If you can see one P wave before each complex, this is sinus tachy. If you can see what looks like more than one P wave before each complex, this is atrial flutter. 
and if you can see no P waves at all or a distorted inverted P waves just before or just after the complex, this is an SVT. So now the question is, where is the best place to check for P waves? You've got 12 leads over there. When I was in the med school, I, uh, I remember that I've been told that actually lead two is the best lead to check for P waves. And I used it for a long time. Then I grow up and I've had some more experience and I've learned that actually anywhere in the ECG should be checked for P waves. So not necessarily P waves, it can be anywhere else. Then I started realizing that actually if I'm going to choose one single lead to check for P waves, the best lead to check is B1. And when I started thinking about it, uh, it, it, it made sense in my head. So have a look at this. This is the anatomy of um, our heart. And if you if you look at this, actually, um, you will notice that number one is the, your SA node and number two is your AV node. So this is where they are anatomically in the heart. This is your SA node position in the heart. And if you remember where we put our leads when we do our ECG, actually, lead V1 is almost just above the SA node. So it makes perfect sense in my head that this is probably the best lead to check for P waves. So going back to our ECG and checking V1, we will start noticing that actually we've got what looks like regular P waves before each complex in V1. And if you look further, you will find in AVL that actually there are P waves there as well. And in lead three, there are P waves. So now we've got a narrow complex, regular tachycardia with one P wave before each complex. So this is sinus tachycardia. So now we know that we've got a patient with sinus tachy with a rate of 173. So what we've covered so far was We've covered the QRS rate, rhythm, width. Um, we haven't talked about the axis yet. And we've talked about the P wave and its relation to the complexes. Next, we've got the intervals to cover. We've got the chamber enlargements, ischemia, and others. Back to our ECG. And let's talk about the axis. So there are so many different ways of checking the axis. Um, my preferred way is I look at lead one and I look at lead AVF. Lead one is to my left hand side and lead AVF is to the side of my right hand side. And I look at the complexes there. If the complex in lead one is pointing up and the complex in lead AVF is pointing up, this means that both hands, both my hands are pointing up. That's a normal axis. If the complex in is in V in lead one is pointing down and in lead AVF is pointing up. This means that my right hand's up, that's right axis deviation and vice versa. If my left hand's up and my right hand's down, that's uh, left axis deviation. Looking at this example, both um, the complexes in both leads are pointing up, but actually we've got a fairly deep S wave in, uh, in lead one. So I would say this is rightish axis deviation rather than a banged or right axis deviation. So that's regarding the axis here. We've covered the P waves in terms of the interval. So we've got a normal PR interval here and uh, the not talking about the QT interval. Um, we have got a fairly long QT interval and that is something that we're going to cover um, in future videos uh, with more details. In terms of chamber enlargements, I uh, can't really see clear, obvious signs of chamber enlargements here. And again, that's something that we're going to cover in the future. And from the ischemia point of view, again, no clear signs of um, significant ST deviation or T wave changes. So in summary, we've got sinus tachycardia, rightish axis deviation, and a long QT interval. So does this match with a TCA overdose? Well, we're going to talk about TCA overdose in uh, the near future 
um, actually with far more details. But let's just cover quickly the ECG changes that happens with TC overdose in here. You get this, you get sinus tachy because of the anti-muscarinic effect of it. You get broad complex and it, it should be really broad when it is broad. So it's more than one big square in width and that's because of the sodium channel toxicity effect of the TCA. You get long QTC, you get right axis deviation and a tall R in AVR. So these are the changes that happens with TCA overdose. So back to our case and let's see what happened. So when this case presented to ED, um, she presented with this tachycardia and this history. So they checked this ECG and unfortunately this ECG was misinterpreted as an SVT. And I can clearly see why. I mean, have a look at this part of the ECG. Looking at this part, actually, there are no clear P waves at all that you can um, confidently see. So it's very easy to look at this and say, oh yeah, that's an SVT. So this patient received two doses of adenosine unnecessarily with no effect at all um, before someone started noticing that actually there are P waves somewhere else in the ECG. Uh, then she was um, treated by magnesium sulfate infusion per Toxbase advice. And uh, Toxbase is the national website in the United Kingdom that's used for any toxicology case. Uh, she's also received some supportive treatment with IV fluids, etc. And, um, and actually she did really well. So heart rate started going down. She clinically improved. She was admitted just for observations um, overnight and she did well at the end, discharged home the day after. So um, this was uh, the case that I wanted to discuss today. Um, and I think we've got so many learning points here. The points that I wanna highlight are, first, you should have a clear approach when interpreting any, any ECG. This is my suggested approach. Start with the QRS, check rate, rhythm, width and axis. Then check the P waves and its relation to the complexes. Check the intervals, PR and QT. Check for chamber enlargement, atria and ventricles. And check for ischemia, check the ST segment, T waves and, QR and Q waves. And lastly, anything else. So that's my first um, learning point. Second is the differential diagnosis of narrow complex regular tachycardia. You've got sinus tachy, SVT, and atrial flutter with fixed block. And the best lead to check for P waves is usually lead V1, but again, don't forget to check everywhere in the ECG. And lastly, the ECG changes with TCA overdose. So we know now that it can cause sinus tachy, wide complex, long QT interval, right axis deviation, and tall R in AVR. And this is it for this case. So um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this useful and I will talk to you very soon. Thank you. Stay safe.